Therefore, I did not feel that was an appropriate or a sufficient platform for me to defend myself against the charge in relation to the Brexit release. I don't think I've been afforded that opportunity throughout this entire process. So that's, that's the point I wish to make, and hopefully I've, I've made that in, in terms of the line of question that I've pursued there. I've noted that in the document we're currently talking about, page 79, paragraph 16, appears to be the only paragraph that deals with the issue of the press release, unless I miss something. There seem to be lots of other things that were in an interview, and the press release was one part of it, but subsequently Mr. Goetcher, having considered the other aspects, has said the matter of language, the matter of behaviour, the matter of the progressives, whatever stance, those are now discounted and majorly in on this. But it, um, would it be possible to have a further meeting with Councillor Hayes to say, look, well, I've considered all those issues, but this is the one I want to explore further with you? No, because Could that have been reasonable? No. No. Uh, the reason is that was the thing there is because it was it was a wide range of complaint. I asked, I was satisfied, perfectly satisfied that what I asked Councillor Hayes about the press release uh, was sufficient to give me the information I needed to make a determination. Then he is basically saying that he did not understand the complaint that was sent to him. I, I just don't, um, A, I don't accept that. He's, a, he's obviously an intelligent and articulate uh, person, and the, the, the letter, whilst it was um, maybe uh, not as well written as it could have been, um, it did uh, clearly refer to the press coverage as something that was a, a source of concern to the complainant and part of the complaint. So it's not my role as the investigator to either restrict the scope of the complaint or expand it, it is to investigate it. Um, it's not for me to tell Councillor Hayes what, what it is and it isn't. He's had, he's had, a, uh, he's had the, the details of it from the monitoring officer. I clearly say to every subject member that I interview, this is their opportunity to respond to the complaint. Um, now, um, in my view, uh, the complaint was sufficiently particularised in relation to the media coverage to make it abundantly clear to anybody who read the letter that the complainant was not happy about it and that was part of what she was complaining about. Yes, um, the other elements of the complaint were about the meeting and the comments about that and evidentially I watched the recording and felt that there was no further part of the code. So yes, the, 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 the document does refer to other matters because there were other matters that were subject to the complaint. But as I said earlier, it's a very narrow issue. The purpose of the investigation is to explore evidence around what happened in the court. It's quite clear what happened. It's fairly um, uncontentious. It's not really significant uh, in, my, uh, in my view that there's just one paragraph about it in the record because that says what Councillor Hayes did and seeks to provide some justification for it, which is the same justification as he's given here today. Yeah. 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 Right at the very beginning, I think you, you said this is not my complaint, this is my captain's complaint. I wrote to you regularly um, on my notes, of, uh, I think it's unfortunate that you actually made so many complaints about so many people. I think that has led to quite an element of confusion, but I can see quite clearly in that paragraph 16 that there was an issue over the press. Now, you know, in the context of all the others, it might have got somewhat lost. Possibly, but nevertheless, it was there at the start, and it's the one that's left standing. Yeah, at this I'm, point. I'm not disputing that, Chair. And I said, don't wish to leave. It was my honour, it's my honestly held view that I feel as though I'm at a disadvantage because I did not feel that the cost of this investigation was over what was said in the press, and I wasn't given sufficient enough platform to defend that position either in the investigation or subsequently. And hopefully, this evening, that will be. As I say, don't wish to leave the point, but I just think that it's important for me to have that on the board. I've made that point to Mr. Goethe continuously, and that is my honesty. I honestly have belief in relation to this process. If it may just move on then, I'll just say that. Let's just see if you finished that. Yeah. Yes, I did want to say on that point. How are you finished going through what you want to tell us completely? I finished, well, I don't think I thought I was asking questions. Right, right. Didn't want to curtail anyone. Councillor, I think I that was formerly just colloquially referred to as the floor. 
Well, I mean, this have a couple, couple more questions. Well, I'm happy to sort of leave them hanging in the air. If Mr. Dutch wants to, to answer them, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll run through them. If, if my, my question was in relation to you finding corroborative evidence in relation to what was said at the Children's Task Force meeting. I know that you did uh, sometime after contact the uh, attendees at that meeting. Uh, and I ask in my comments to the report why it is you haven't contacted Mr. McCallum. Didn't you not think it was important to contact Mr. McCallum for if he did say that he was approached by Dr. Atkinson in relation to reputational management or what have you? Uh, then that would be a corroboration of what I said. Um, he, my understanding is he wasn't at the meeting. He wasn't. I had and, and I was exploring what was said at that meeting. I mean, I don't think there's any dispute that um, there were issues around reputation management, not simply um, in relation to the decision in respect of the report, but prior to that, in terms of responding to the um, issues of trade and press coverage when the convictions in the Crown Court. Um, so I didn't feel, having contacted everybody at the meeting, not their response, I didn't think it would add any evidence to value one way or another because he wasn't at the meeting, so he was to tell what he said. But if, but if he was contacted subsequent to the meeting and asked advice specifically related to reputational management, which is what I maintain, and you know, I'm here, you can see the whites of my eyes, I, I maintain that that was said at that meeting. I'm not lying about that, that was said then there would have been some evidence in relation to that being said. <coughs> surely there would have been some progress value in that. I, I think we're going to disagree, so again, yeah. we're, we're playing for the votes. Yeah. Um, the, you mentioned the Heaston case um, in terms of it being uh, officers. You know, it's accepted, I think, that Dr. Atkinson is not an officer of the council. Uh, indeed, she, you know, I, this, this, this evening I've asked that this entire meeting be in public. If she had an issue as to what I said, then I'm sure she is robust enough, a, a, an official, to make those um, make those statements to the press. I think I felt the need. You mentioned defamation law. If Professor Atkinson wishes to take an action in relation to defamation, then she is perfectly entitled to do so. Can she I, is I, she's not an officer of the council. She is a she is a. If these questions are answered. Low is at an all-time low, 
and that was the natural uh, route for people to take in relation to how they would feel about this particular situation. Um, I can see uh, Councillor McLaughlin is perhaps asking me a question about that, or do you want to wait until I'm going to wait until you finish, Paul, but okay. uh, I'm only using that what you just said. Okay, so no problem. Thanks, Pat. That will be the case. I'm going to say that we all strive to serve the public as best we can, to hold standards that we can. Yeah. Our actions are not always appreciated or trusted, but regardless of party, we are here to serve. Absolutely. <coughs> and I, I don't think I need any contradiction to that statement, Chair. Right. <coughs> so I, I'd like to make the statement as I've written it. Firstly, we cannot lose sight of the fact that this matter would not be before you today had the local authority not failed in its duty to protect vulnerable children. And I say this because I think it's important that this complaint, a complaint which I respectfully submit as little more than a sideshow, does not deflect from the very serious errors made by the Council which cause suffering and heartache to vulnerable children and their families. And to more point, I don't say this as a political point. I say this because it's right that we all acknowledge, collectively as a Council, that we fail these children. You're not answering the point I've made, I've made a point. Uh, sorry, the, the point you previously made in terms of not bringing good politics is this. Sorry, it is addressed. Okay. Sorry, I should have kind of found that point. Um, when, when these terrible abuses are perpetrated by the rights and fair of others came to light, I am in no doubt that the intention of everyone in this council and indeed partner agencies was to resolve that we should do all in our power to learn from the mistakes from the flawed decision making and poor oversight and do all we can to ensure that they do not happen again. Indeed, I'll say that there's no doubt in my mind that the complainant has exactly the same resolve. But we do differ in parts on how we do this and this is something for which I do not apologise and I'm happy to restate for the record. I firmly and honestly believe that Dr Atkinson's decision not to publish a report and I will add a report that should of course hold the anonymity of victims is wrong. I believe that in not publishing an anonymised report, then confidence in this process will be undermined in the eyes of the public. And yes, it leaves us all, all of us charged with ensuring these mistakes do not happen again, open to accusations of cover-up and whitewash. It seems that in stating these views, Mr. Boucher believes I have somehow erred in my duty to show respect. I could not disagree more. I have a duty to be respectful, and this I acknowledge, and I maintain, maintain that I have discharged this duty throughout my ten years and more as an elected member. But I equally acknowledge my duty of openness, honesty, and accountability. If I did not publicly state an honestly held belief regarding an issue of such importance, then I believe it is then that I would have failed in my duty. If I simply unquestionably <coughs> accepted the decision of Dr Atkinson, whilst knowing as I do, that I believe that the decision is damaging to the confidence of the public and victims in our resolve to make good on the grievous errors we have made, then I would be failing in my duty. Chair members, if we were to commission a poll, and believe me, I don't suggest we do that because I think we spent quite enough money on this investigation, but if we were to randomly ask a sample of the public, if a report into failings by a public body which put at risk <coughs> vulnerable people is not published, despite guidelines stating it should, would you be inclined to believe there was a cover up? Chair members, I think we all know that the answer would be a resounding yes. Surely we must all recognise the environment in which we as public servants now operate. The age of deference is thankfully dead. The public no longer blindly accept and believe in the benevolence and competency of officialdom and those involved in public life. Therefore, Chair, I truly believe that my comments have a grounding in fact. It seems that Mr Boucher believes that by stating this fact, that a failure to publish a report Requiring publication under guidelines would lead to accusations of a cover up. I've shown, uh, I've shown a lack of respect. Well, I would respectfully urge this panel to take an alternative view. If I was to be found to have breached the code by saying what I believe to be true, 
and indeed something which will widely be accepted as true, then we <coughs> to leave us as elected members. I recall Mr. Boucher saying in my interview that I chose my words carefully in my statements in the press. Yes, I did. I know words matter. I did not accuse anyone of a cover-up. I merely stated the fact, and yes, it surely is a fact, that should the report not be made public, then there will be accusations of a cover-up. Chair, you and members will know that I have often spoken about the need for the Council's meetings to be public wherever possible. I have questioned the use of task and finish groups because they meet behind closed doors. I have insisted that agenda items which include presentations are published to allow public scrutiny. I even asked that this meeting be public this evening once convened. And I mention these, these topics not because I want to rehearse the arguments, but to evidence that I have long been a believer in open public scrutiny. A believer in the necessity of using not just scrutiny committees in town halls to hold decision makers to account, but to let the press and the general public also hold us to account. Therefore, my position on the publication of the report should not come as any surprise. It was not me deciding to judge on some bandwagon, but me making an honest comment which upholds my previously publicly stated belief that openness and public accountability is the best mechanism to ensure effective public services which protect our most vulnerable and advance the interests of our communities. Chair, I've not addressed the issue regarding the scrutiny meeting in this statement, as hopefully you will concur, as you have done, in Mr. Coach's opinion that there is no case to answer. I will say that throughout this process, I have been under the impression that my conduct at the scrutiny meeting was the first of the investigation. And, and I go on to the statement to recollect <coughs> what Mr. Coach has said to me about the, the work experience person at the uh, <coughs> And I say this because I believe it evidences that this is a perfectly valid assumption to have made. Dr Atkinson's complaint as forwarded to me was centred around my conduct at that meeting, conduct which she has shown to have a completely flawed recollection of. In addition, you will note that Dr Atkinson's interview has 14 paragraphs devoted to that specific meeting of the scrutiny meeting. Just four relate to the press coverage. And I was asked just one question in relation to the press coverage. I make this point as it speaks to my position that during this process I have not had adequate opportunity to address the concerns of the investigator regarding my statements to the press. Hopefully I have endeavour to address these to you this evening. Chair, I am accused of failing to show a lack of respect by my actions in speaking to the press honestly about a decision made by Dr Atkinson which I believe will undermine confidence in the local authorities' determination to put wrong right the wrongs which fail these vulnerable children. A lack of respect in my actions and the language I use is what I stand accused of. <clears throat> I know that you are here to adjudicate on this complaint specifically, so perhaps you might disregard the lack of respect shown to my group leader when he was verbally attacked outside this very building by a copper cabinet member and in a torrent of foul language called a liar. But as it took place in tandem with the events we are discussing this evening, so it is perhaps a useful yardstick from which we can all measure respect. I submit that this and the language used by the complainants in page 89 and 90. This is the letter um, which instigates the debate, which I have only seen once I had cited this report, Chair. The full one. The, well, I think, you know, <coughs> the accusations that will be made of the is immediate. I, I, yeah, you, you can see in the, the final couple of paragraphs how, how great they are. Um, but, you know, I, I submit that the language used by the complainants in this letter in page 89 and 90, which I actually deem defamatory and upon which I would take separate advice, stand in stark contrast to the language I have used in my correspondence to the press and indeed language I have used throughout my political life. Chair members, I recall using the phrase justice needs to, see, to be seen to be done during my interview with Mr. Bocher. It's a principle which has underpinned our system for decades, and so too should it apply to investigations 
into serious failures by competence or authority which causes pain and suffering to individuals. I made my comments in the press not to show Dr. Atkinson a lack of respect, but to state what I believe to be fact. Failure to publish a report would undoubtedly, in my mind, lead to accusations of a cover up. Chair, in the current climate, how can this be denied? I stand by this statement. I know that Dr. Atkinson has not chosen to attend this evening, however, I'm ready to answer your questions and continue to operate throughout this process as I have also thus far. Yeah, I mean, I was at the scrutiny committee meeting, I saw, I saw the exchange, and I thought of you about the language used in um, my dad, for um, letters and statements. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't reflect what I saw. Sorry, could you speak up? Yeah, I'm saying that the language that's used in the, in the statement by my dad, it doesn't reflect what I saw. I saw an exchange which I haven't seen my copy. However, and I'm looking at the one specific complaint that's left, which is whether or not um, what you have said in the press would lead people to think that Maggie Atkinson's decision was taken in order to cover up. And the bit that bothered me most is that not the, this is kept under lock and key business, it's this, I'm appalled by this decision, but you had been given a very clear view of the dangers of not taking this decision, and that was bad. And that is the bit that is bothering me, Paul, that in the light of the information that you had when you did this, when you made these, I am appalled by this decision, that is a criticism of a professionally made decision backed by a national panel, and that is, I can't, and so if I go on to the rest of it, it's being kept under lock and key. Mm -hmm. It was, it's being, it was being, the, the reasons were the protection of the young person involved. And, and that is bothering me completely. Mm -hmm. and, and I have to say, that leads me to, to the view, despite all that I've heard from you, and you know, I know you're passionate about openness, and, and I've heard that, that view that you've expressed about and all that switch expressed on a number of occasions, but it does lead me to think that you knew what you were doing and you said this decision is appalling, I'm appalled by this decision, I, and it will make people believe there is a is that you were trying to imply that it was a problem. Because I can't understand why you didn't accept the um, what you said about the reasons for the decision. And, uh, I think the, the two separate issues to be fair, I don't understand why you you, you join them together, but I, I still am of the opinion that the report should have been published. I, I think that, yeah, the, the fact is that I, I, Mr. Coach mentions about evidence, but what evidence could I or anyone have possibly had in relation to a couple of people? A report is not published. It, it, it needs the disinfectant of the light of day when <coughs> such matters as important as this about ourselves as a council. It needs us to be as open as, and honest as possible, and that, that's my view. And I am appalled by the decision because I don't think uh, in making that decision, and you know, Dr. Atkinson's not here today, but I don't think in, in making that decision, Dr. Atkinson had due regard as to the confidence of the damage um, to the confidence of the people of Wirral and uh, throughout the country that will be should a report not be published. I understand she has her reasons. I have my reasons for my honestly held belief, and, and that, that's it's, still true. It's her motivation that I'm, I'm interested in, and your analysis of the motivation. And, and in that statement that you made, to me, looking at that, you have implied a motivation. No, I have not implied a cover-up. I've said that there will be accusations of cover-up. I think in the current climate, that's where the decision here lies, isn't it? Absolutely, but that, 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 is, that is what I, I believe. You know, okay. She has her beliefs, I have my beliefs. And I, we've I, I think, what we've heard. Absolutely, so, I, think, I think by not doing that, it, 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 you know, it, it, it deals a, a, a almost fatal view, a fatal blow even to confidence people have in the entire process. Like, 
child protection. After all, I think that there's very solid reasons as to why the government and parliament laid regulations that said that the report should be published. Guidelines and the primary consideration is always going to be the safety of the individual. Absolutely, the individual and the individuals, because there are numerous victims here, there may well have been victims who would like to see a copy of that report. How did that happen? <coughs> you know, I've got no access to the information. The, the, the reports that Okay, I understand what you're saying, and I, I think I've, I've heard what you've got to say, and yeah. I've still considered my, my view. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm just pondering on these things and appreciate that I sit in other places considering some of these issues, but not remember the safeguarding board or whatever. Therefore, probably over the last three years, become more acquainted than I have been previously with some of the issues facing <coughs> Some of the difficulties of uh, trying to establish the best ways of protecting young people. Now, the, we maybe uh, I'll explore this. Um, a report might actually be presented in public, and a redacted report has not been presented in public. But officers have uh, people working in that sphere. Grounding in what the findings were, which led to a series of recommendations, as I recall, it might have been many over 30 from memory. I think I read the recommendations at some point, but I don't have them before me now, and sometimes since I looked at them. But I think no doubt the professionals who got the report before them would have been under uh, clear scrutiny from the board. And we might get some chairs involved in it, and that no doubt some things they had to do differently or get right. That's my context. So, as members, we know that that would be going on in the background. It's important the way these reports, apart from the paragraphs achieved, Maggie Atkinson may not have put that full construction strength to the, the response of the officers and departments and various agencies to it. That's what goes in the mind of trying to place it in context. So, um, so when we're saying, well, we would never have seen the light of day and would have a block of key, I can see that these might come to mind as a reason to make a point beyond that, I begin to get a bit worried about the context of the politics of it and so on. I, I can, I'm trying to work my way through what was the full picture. You'll forgive me. I mean, well, to cover that, that's the way I'm trying to understand it. Yeah, I mean, Chair, that, that, that's, that's a perfectly acceptable view to take, that you trust the officers to uh, accept the findings of the report, although we, as members, have not been able to see it. Uh, but you will know, as well as I, uh, that this council previously has been criticised for simply accepting officers' recommendations. I, I take the view that I'm here to perhaps throw the whole people to account and to wherever possible involve the public in, in decision making and I think the public will have a very um, conducted role when they view and indeed the press when viewing reports such as this. I think it, it's something to be frank about I think it's the, the point of all process that the public as well as the members as well as council officials and senior managers make sure that they have a
second, they distorted your views, and in that case, you might have been wearing that one. Well, they may have been wearing that one, but yeah, it's, it's not something I can say. First of all, thank you for the invitation. Yes, thank you, Mr.
particularly in relation to the possible identification of the victim of this horrendous crime. Um, I don't think anybody's made enough of that during this evening as to the possible repercussions uh, involving the, the individual who we read in here is still under um, medical care and will be for some time. On his own admission, Councillor Hayes issued a press release and I agree with the finding at 90 on page 153 that there has been a failure to comply with the code by Councillor Hayes in respect to his comments reported in the press as set out in paragraph 25 above. And I think that's the, the nub of the whole business as far as I'm concerned. I think there's been a lot of hot air and extraneous material brought in, but that is the hub as far as I'm concerned. Well, I've been here before.